Hey everybody, Mrs. Horn here. I've got some notes on chapter 51, which is all about animal behavior. I'm on page 74 in the packet, and I think before we get into the bulk of the notes, I need to explain to you what behavior actually means. So in the space you have, maybe on the top or even in the margin, I'd like to give you the definition of what behavior is. So behavior is an action. It's carried out by an organism, they're using their muscles, and it's in response to some kind of a stimulus. Now, I have three examples here. This cute little black cat chickadee um, sings a song. That song could be to attract a mate. That song could be a warning sound. There are some chickadees that have a very high-pitched um, shrill that's re very repetitive, and that would be warning other chickadees that there is some kind of a predator or danger. This possum releases a scent. When a possum is trying to avoid a predator, a lot of times it pretends to play dead and it releases a scent that makes it actually smell like it's dead. And then I have this crab at the bottom and this crab has one claw that's super huge and sometimes the behavior that this crab exhibits is, is it waves the claw and it would wave the claw for, for one of two reasons. It might actually be doing it to attract a female because they think that claw is awesome, or they might be doing it to repel or um, scare other males away. So over on page 75, I want to talk about the sensory inputs. And I want to start with talking about a fixed action pattern. And you can see that I, I'm, I forgot a word there. I need you to add the word action in between fixed and pattern. And an example of a fixed action pattern is an act that's linked to some kind of a stimulus. Um, birds and fish, their migration patterns as they move to different areas are using certain environmental cues. Could be the angle of the sun in the sky, could be a temperature cue, could be amount of light during the daytime. Bees use the waggle dance to communicate um, and they use it to tell the rest of the hive where there is a food location nearby. Um, and if you look at this picture here, and I do want you to sketch something similar to this on that space you have on page 75, um, there's three different patterns that a bee might waggle or dance to indicate the direction that the food is located in. There are some good videos and clips of the waggle dance on YouTube, so feel free to pause it hop over to YouTube and type in honeybee waggle dance and it will show you a real life video of what the bee is actually doing. All of the patterns involve a, a figure eight of some sort and the direction that the bees move straight has a good indication as to where the food is located. Also feel free to pause the video here so that you can sketch these different um, waggle dances. Pheromones are chemicals that are released from organisms and these chemicals usually uh, help to communicate between members of the same species through some kind of an odor or a taste. Um, examples of how animals use them. One could be it could be mating, uh, some kind of a reproductive behavior, something that would trigger courtship. Fruit flies are an animal that uses pheromones for those reasons. A queen bee, if we're talking about honeybees, uh, that queen bee releases pheromones to attract her workers and to keep them coming back to that hive. Um, there are also some animals that release an alarm signal um, for example, when a minnow is injured, it releases pheromones, which triggers a, a fright response from everybody out, from all the other minnows in the area. So they kind of um, could crawl away or hide somewhere because they're worried that a predator is going to come in and injure them as well.
before I go on to the notes on page 77, I wanted to show you a few pictures that I pulled up here. Uh, we just talked about a fixed action pattern, and this was some kind of an action that was linked to a stimulus. Um, this type of a fish is called a stickleback, and the, stickle, the male sticklebacks are um, when they see a red belly on other male sticklebacks, they attack them. They, um, they charge at them, they attack that red color. Whereas when they see a female, the female doesn't have the red coloring on the bottom, so they don't attack them. They usually try to court those females. So the, the stimulus would be the red color of the belly. Um, they always want to attack that. That's their action. That's their response to the red. But when they don't see the red, um, they're not attacking them. They actually try to court that fish. Um, on the previous page, we had talked about uh, migration and organisms using environmental cues. Monarch migration is an example, and they use the position of the sun to find where their wintering position in Mexico is going to be. And then the waggle dance. He, this is a great video here if you want to copy and paste this into YouTube. This shows that waggle dance really well. Over on page 77, I have a chart with different behaviors. Uh, the first one I want to start with is called innate behavior. And an innate behavior is something that's developmentally fixed. It's controlled by DNA. They're born, and that behavior is already there. Monarch butterflies show that innate behavior through um, part, part of that is um, when they migrate. Part of that is it's built within them. That's in their DNA to move at, at different times of the year. Imprinting. Imprinting is a behavior that's learned and innate. So it's a little bit of DNA, but it's also a little bit of they learn as, after they're born. Um, this doesn't really have anything to do with uh, vampires on Twilight, um, but has a lot to do with ducklings following their mom around. Um, a couple years ago, we had some ducklings at my house. Remind me to tell you that story. Spatial learning. Spatial learning is when organisms create memories to remember things around them. So they remember ways to get back to their nests. Um, wasp finds their nest by remembering landmarks around them. So might, they might remember the red barn or the certain type of a tree that was a distance from their nest, and, and they remember those landmarks to get back to their space. Associative learning. This is when animals learn from past choices that may not have been good ones. Uh, my example here is when blue jays, blue jays don't eat monarchs, and they don't eat them because they get sick from eating the monarchs. It's not actually the monarch that makes them sick, but monarchs eat milkweed, which is a plant. Uh, it's the milkweed that makes the blue jay sick. The blue jay doesn't know that. But the blue jay knows that if it eats a monarch or anything that looks like a monarch, it's not going to feel great. So it stays away from them altogether. And then there's a social learning. This is learning by watching others. Um, there's a great uh, trailer, or there's a great movie, um, a Disney movie. It's called Chimpanzee. And if you go to YouTube and type in movie trailer for Disney's Chimpanzee, it will show you a two-minute video on this baby chimp, and he mimics everything that the adults do, including using tools. And that's a great example of social learning. Uh, vervet monkeys is a good example. Also, these are monkeys that live in Africa, um, and they have two different calls. One call is to alert the population that there's a predator coming from the sky. The other call is to alert the population that there's a predator coming from the ground. And as the, the young monkeys grow up, they learn the difference between those two calls, um, and they, they practice them. The third part of the notes is all about survival and reproductive success. Uh, foraging is a behavior, and it's a behavior that helps an organism obtain food, but it includes anything about food. So anything that would mean searching for food, recognizing that that's something good to eat, and then capturing it or, or collecting it. That's all considered part of foraging. Um, there's an example of 
So let's talk about the Northwestern Crow. And this crow is a great example of uh, how it gets the most food using the least amount of energy. So the crow eats whelk, it's a type of a, a, a sea snail, but in order to get the shells open, they have to crack the shells. So they pick up a snail, they fly up into the air, and then they drop them. And when they drop on the rock, just right, they're hoping that it cracks open. So the higher they fly up, uh, the better chance it is for it to crack, but they're also using more energy. So the optimal foraging technique is how high do they have to fly to get it to crack, but not wasting a ton of energy. Some research has been done on this, and they've actually calculated that if they fly a height of about five meters, that's optimal for cracking the shell, but also conserving energy. There are mating behaviors that animals exhibit. Uh, the first one is promiscuous. This is random mating. Uh, they don't have a strong bond with another of their species. There's also monogamous. Um, Western gulls have a monogamous relationship. Uh, mute swans have a monogamous relationship. So they, they mate for life. Um, and then the last two, um, polygamous or polygamy, this is when one male will mate with many females. Um, elk would be in this category or even white-tailed deer. Um, and polyandry, this is when one female mates with many males. Uh, there are some bird uh, duck varieties that, that do this. Um, in the case of a polyandry, the female bird would actually be the one that was more decorated, whereas in a, in a polygamy relationship or a polygamy um, pairing, it's usually the male that's more decorated. Um, I was just kind of alluding to this. Sexual dimorphism is when there's a difference in appearance between the males and the females. So if we consider a monogamous relationship or monogamous species, typically the male and the females kind of look the same. They're really hard to distinguish. One is not more showy than the other, whereas in a polygonous species, one gender is showier and, and typically a little bit bigger than the other. So think of uh, peacocks, pheasants, uh, even mallard ducks. There's one that's prettier, more colorful than the other. And the last section we have here, altruism. Altruism is defined as a species that increases their fitness of the whole group while decreasing the fitness of one individual. So one individual might make a sacrifice that would better the population or better the whole group. Um, a naked mole rat is something that has, um, that shows altruism. Um, and it's common for one of the non-reproductive members of the group to actually sacrifice their life in trying to protect one of the reproducing females. Um, this is a picture of a naked mole rat in the middle there as a female. The color of queen, usually there's uh, a few of them for the population, and um, it's common for one of the, one, another member of the group to make a sacrifice and attempt to protect the queen. So that's called altruism. So that will finish up chapter 51, and I hope this helps.